I would like to introduce Melanie Mitchell, the Davis Professor of Complexity at the Santa Fe Institute, based in the USA. Professor Mitchell's research spans several domains, complex systems, computer science, and cognitive science. Professor Mitchell is the author of numerous academic papers and also several books, including the award-winning book Complexity, a guided tour. In 2010, this book won the highly prestigious the Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science, given to outstanding science books. Her latest book, Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans, is also a lucid, informative, and engaging read. Today, Professor Mitchell will share her insights on why AI is harder than we think. So, many of you have uh, been reading about the promise of self-driving cars for years. This appeared in, I think, 2015 in The Guardian, that promising that in 2020, we'd all have self-driving cars and never have to drive again. Uh, the following year, uh, the Business Insider promised that 10 million self-driving cars would be on the road by 2020. 2020 seemed to be a popular year for making these predictions. And in 2019, Elon Musk, the, um, uh, the CEO of Tesla, promised that a year from now, that is 2020, we'll have over a million cars with full self-driving software, everything. Okay, so now it's 2022 and none of these things have happened yet. So I wanted to read this quote from an AI researcher. Perhaps expectations are too high and this will eventually result in disaster. Suppose that five years from now, funding collapses miserably as autonomous vehicles fail to roll. Every startup company fails and there's a big backlash so you can't get money for anything connected with AI. Everybody hurriedly changes the names of their research projects to something else. This condition is called the AI winter. Well, interestingly, this was actually written in 1984 by Drew McDermott, an AI uh, researcher at Yale. And uh, it was talking about the cyclic nature of AI research, where we have these periods of extremely high optimism, and then uh, promises are made, like about self-driving cars, and then are not met. And there's a lot of disappointment about the field, and funding collapses, and now it's the AI winter. So this happened in 1984 was the year I started graduate school. And when I graduated in 1990, uh, we were in the midst of an AI winter. And I was advised not to put the um, term artificial intelligence on uh, my job applications. Uh, of course, this just shows that these cycles have continued. Now we're in the midst of what might be called an AI spring, and yet we're still seeing that things like promises of self-driving cars haven't occurred. Um, so these kinds of predictions have been going on for since the field of AI began. Claude Shannon, the, found, the, the inventor of information theory, predicted in 1961 that within 10 or 15 years, we'd see something like what he called the robots of science fiction fame, sort of those robots we see in movies. Uh, a few years later, Herbert Simon, uh, one of the pioneers of AI, predicted that within 20 years of 1965, machines would be able to do any work that, quote, a man can do. Of course, that's the, lang the sexist language of 1965, but he meant any work that any human would be able to do. Marvin Minsky, the founder of the AI lab at MIT, uh, predicted that within a generation, maybe 20, 25 years from 1967, the problem of creating AI would be substantially solved. Well, many years later, um, John, John McCarthy, another pioneer of AI said that um, the problem was that AI was harder than we thought. But you might say that actually, AI is still harder than we think. We're getting uh, promises, say from Shane Legg in uh, 2008, Shane Legg was the co-founder of uh, Google DeepMind, that human level AI will be passed in the mid 2020s. Well, we're getting there soon. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, said in 2015 that one of the goals for the next five to 10 years of his company, now called Meta, of course, is to basically get better than human level 
AI at all of the primary human senses, which he described as vision, hearing, language, and general cognition. Uh, and Stuart Russell, a prominent AI researcher from uh, Berkeley, asked in his recent book, when will super intelligent AI arrive? And he said it will probably happen in the lifetime of his children, um, which he said is more conservative than that of the typical AI researcher. So we're still getting predictions of relatively near term human level or even super intelligent AI. So is AI still harder than we think? I would say yes, and um, I want to argue that in part, it's because of four, what I call fallacies um, of our, our, our thinking about intelligence and about AI. Um, so the first fallacy, and I should say none of these fallacies are new, but I think together they give a good reason why we tend to be over optimistic about where we are. So the first one is that narrow AI is on a continuum with general AI. The idea there is that if we achieve uh, progress in narrow AI, that that is the same as achieving progress in general AI. So we get things like claims from IBM that its Watson program represents a first step into cognitive systems, uh, which is what their term for general AI. Um, so this idea that first step, we're, get, we're taking a, a first step on a continuum towards this general AI. Um, it's AlphaZero, uh, the, the successor of AlphaGo, um, was described as the first step in creating real AI. GPT-2, the predecessor of the famous GPT-3, of course, was seen as a step towards general intelligence. And these are all just quotes from people uh, who are, I think, falling into this fallacy that when we make progress on narrow um, areas of AI, that those are steps towards general intelligence. Now, the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus actually had a name for this, the first step fallacy, which he uh, described as the claim that, you know, we've been inching along this continuum so that any improvement in our programs, no matter how trivial, counts as progress. Um, but he cites this discontinuity in this continuum of steady incremental progress, which is the common sense knowledge problem. He calls it an unexpected obstacle. So I'll have more to say about that later on. But I think that he's correct, and that none of these, the all of these um, systems are running into this obstacle. His brother, Stuart Dreyfus, an engineer, uh, made an analogy. He said it's like claiming that the first monkey that climbed a tree was making progress toward landing on the moon. So the second um, fallacy is that. Um, Easy things are easy and hard things are hard. And what I mean by that is that things that we humans find easy, we assume will be easy for computers. And things that we humans find very hard are things that um, we assume will be hard for computers. And this can be very subtle. So for example, Herbert Simon, who I quoted earlier, who was a Nobel Prize winner, a cognitive scientist, and a pioneer of the field. Simon said that everything of interest in cognition happens above the 100 millisecond level, the time it takes to recognize your mother. Well, what he's saying is that um, in AI, we can kind of filter out all of those things that um, happen in cognition below the 100 millisecond level, all those perceptual things, and we only have to reason about, worry about things like reasoning and so on. So that was sort of, he said that in the 1960s or 70s, uh, at the time when people were really focused on symbolic AI, which pretty much ignored perception. But even more recently, Andrew Ng, who's a, a AI researcher and, uh, and entrepreneur, echoed Simon. This was just a few years ago. He said, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, that is, people find it easy, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. So uh, this assumption that if, we, if it's easy for us, 
we'll probably be able to automate it using AI soon. And Demis Hasebis, co-founder of uh, DeepMind, uh, in a slightly more subtle uh, uh, expression of this, said that Go is one of the most challenging of domains. That is play, playing the game of Go. And the question is challenging for whom? It's certainly challenging for humans, but is Go one of the most challenging of domains for AI? Well, as the uh, cognitive scientist Gary Marcus pointed out, Go uh, is a very uh, closed domain uh, with uh, rule, specific rules that are quite formal, formalizable. And it might be that a simple game like charades, which any six-year-old can play, um, which uses language, is open-ended, which requires theory of mind, actually is much more challenging for AI than the human challenging game of Go. These are all summed up in what's called Moravec's paradox. This is due to the um, roboticist Hans Moravec, who said that it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on IQ tests or playing checkers. At the time, checker, we hadn't, at the time he said this, uh, machines hadn't yet uh, beat grandmasters at chess. But it's, Difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. And I would add, and common sense. So this is still true. And I think one of the um, reasons that we tend to become over-optimistic about where we are in AI is that we forget how hard it is to get computers to do the things that are most easy for us. And Marvin Minsky said, said it this way later, after his uh, predictions about AI failed, he said, in general, we're least aware of what our minds do best. The third fallacy is what I call the lure of wishful mnemonics. I got this term wishful mnemonics from uh, Drew McDermott, the Yale researcher uh, who I quoted earlier, who back in 1976 wrote a paper called Artificial Intelligence Meets Natural Stupidity, which is a very short, uh, very, uh, insightful paper about how people misuse or anthropomorphize words and convince themselves that their machines are doing what humans do. And he gave an example, um, which was actually a, a, a true example. If a researcher calls the main loop of his program understand, he is uh, merely begging the question and he might lead, mislead a lot of people prominently himself. And what he should do instead is to refer to this main loop as G0034 and see if he can convince himself or anyone else that it implements some part of understanding. And he said many instructive examples of wishful mnemonics by AI researchers come to mind once you see the point. So this was written a long time ago and yet we still have many examples of what I think of as wishful mnemonics. For example, um, in machine learning, People give names to benchmark data sets. They name them after the abilities that people hope they will test, like reading comprehension, common sense understanding, general language understanding evaluation. These are actual names of, of benchmark data sets. And then when machines actually do well on these data sets, in many cases better than humans, we um, sometimes will assume that they have actually done well on things like reading comprehension, common sense understanding or general language understanding. And yet they haven't, but the names of these benchmark data sets um, tend to convince us otherwise, even though the data sets themselves don't actually do a good job of testing for the underlying task. This was uh, said in a uh, very good paper called Shortcut Learning, Learning in Deep Neural Networks. We must not confuse performance on a data set with the acquisition of an underlying ability. And that's an extremely common confusion, I think, that happens not only in the general public, but also in machine learning researchers themselves. Even more um, kind of subtly, we call our methods things like deep learning, where what these systems do is very different than human learning. And yet calling it learning forces us to kind of make that analogy and said, yes, these systems are learning on their own, even though what they're doing is quite different from 
human learning. We call them neural networks, even though they're rather different than what's happening in the nervous system in the brain. We also make over attributions, which is a psychological term, uh, in descriptions of what these machines have learned. So here's one example. Uh, you may have seen this, uh, Google DeepMind, uh, one of the things that they did early on before they were part of Google was to train uh, deep neural networks using deep Q learning to um, play Atari video games like Breakout where you have a paddle that uh, you move and the paddle hits a ball that then uh, bounces off of bricks. And the goal is to uh, destroy the highest level bricks here by uh, hitting them with the ball. And their, their system learned this strategy or discovered the strategy where, uh, as they say, um, is the optimal strategy, which is to make a tunnel here around the side and then allow the ball to hit blocks by bouncing behind the wall. But notice they're using these human terms, tunnel, uh, ball, <laughs> blocks, wall. These are terms that we humans use when we're thinking about this game but the machine has only learned uh, from raw pixels. It doesn't have these concepts. If it did have these concepts, it should be able to transfer these concepts from the standard version of breakout, which I picture here, to a slightly different version where the paddle is shifted up by a few pixels. So this was tested in, 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 and written about in a paper in 2017 a system that was able to, uh, that, that discovered that strategy um, on standard breakout was when given uh, this new version of breakout wasn't able to play the game well at all. So in, actually it had never learned really learned these concepts. It had learned some other kinds of configurations of pixels that um, were not generalizable. So just a few other examples. I mean, I think you get the general idea you know, IBM uh, claimed that its Watson program could read all of the healthcare texts in the world, where reading, of course, implies in the human sense, understanding what has been read. But in Watson's case, it was doing something else. It was processing language in a way that it actually did not understand uh, what these healthcare texts were saying. Uh, you know, using words like understand, or even things like goal, where AlphaGo had a goal, which is a very different thing from a human goal, but we talk about it, we, we, we sort of give it the aura of a human goal. Uh, and you, know, you just go on and on with these kinds of attributions. So the question is, is this just an inevitable shorthand or a misleading anthropomorphism that makes us think that AI can do more than it actually can? Finally, the the last fallacy is that intelligence is all in the brain. So this is something that's been kind of a, a view in AI since the very beginning that we don't have to worry about the body. We can implement intelligence in a computer that's sitting on our desk, uh, you know, without any kind of uh, body or interaction, social interaction or in embeddedness in a culture. Uh, Newell and Simon famously uh, uh, hypothesized that intelligence is what they call the physical symbol system, which has no, no uh, need for any kind of body, except to sort of provide the perceptual input uh, to the intelligence part of the system. Uh, more recently, uh, this philosopher wrote that um, it's more likely than not that 10 to the 15th uh, floating point operations per second is enough to perform tasks as well as the human brain, given the right software, which might be very hard to create. But the idea here is that as, as soon as we get to the computational capacity of the brain, whatever that means, that all we need to do is find the right software to create intelligence and perform tasks as well as the human brain. No body needed. And Jeffrey Hinton, one of the, um, pioneers of deep learning said that to understand documents at a human level, we're gonna need human level resources. But what he meant by that was uh, something like the number of connections in the brain. 
And he said, we're a few magnitude, orders of magnitude off, but I'm sure the hardware people will fix that. And you know, a lot of people think that if we, only we could get to the computational uh, sort of abilities of the brain by itself, perhaps even through say quantum computers, um, we should be able to sort of solve AI, if you will. But of course, uh, many cognitive scientists have uh, hypothesized that the brain is not an, the, the only or even the sufficient uh, equipment needed for cognition that the brain and the body actually work together. This is called the embodied cognition hypothesis. Um, Don Tucker, a neuroscientist, notes that there's no brain parts for disembodied cognition. All of the networks in uh, the brain that are implemented in cognition are linked to sensory systems, to motor systems, or other motivational systems. And Lakoff and Johnson have um, famously shown in depth how we um, understand language. And in fact, all of our thoughts are based on our experiences of the physical world and the flow of time. And this is shown in the metaphors that we make in our language. Uh, so this idea of the brain um, not being the only thing necessary for cognition that, you know, you can't just have a brain in a vat, if you will, is the Im uh, embodied cognition hypothesis. So all of these fallacies bring up some questions. If narrow AI is not on a continuum with general AI, how is it that we can assess progress towards general or human level AI? If easy things for humans are not easy for computers and vice versa, how can we assess the difficulty of a domain for AI? Um, how do we talk to ourselves about, about what machines can and cannot do without fooling ourselves with wishful mnemonics? And how embodied or socially, socially, culturally embedded does intelligence need to be? I don't think anyone knows the answers to these, but I think these are some of the more important questions about AI. So I just want to um, spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so talking about some of what I think are the major open challenges in AI that are you know, sort of highlighted in these various fallacies. Of course, you know, human learning is very different, as I said before, from current machine learning. And one of the ways that it's very different is that we really don't need thousands or even millions of examples like machines do to learn a concept. So consider the concept of a bridge, okay? So I think you could probably, you know, with a thousand or 10,000 or more examples of pictures of bridges, maybe you could get a deep neural network to recognize uh, new pictures of bridges um, as long as they uh, obeyed this same quote unquote distribution. But um, humans can learn this concept with just a few examples. And not only that, we learn in a way that allows us to generalize. So if we've learned about what a bridge is, we can spot this kind of thing, which looks very different from what the things I just showed you as a kind of bridge or a water bridge where uh, the bridge is really for boats to cross uh, a highway underneath uh, the, the water. Um, so it's kind of an inversion of a normal bridge. Uh, we also are able to take what we learned and abstract it and make analogies and metaphors. So, you know, we, we can recognize this as a bridge built by ants with their bodies so that the ants can cross a gap. Or we can talk about bridging our hands or the bridge of a nose or the bridge of a song. These are all uh, terms in which we take this concrete concept and abstract it and use it sort of more metaphorically you know, bridging the gender gap is something we talk about a lot. Uh, when Joe Biden was running for president, he described himself as a bridge to a new generation of leaders. This was a, a term we understood without even noticing that it was being used metaphorically. 
And if you wanted to visualize it, you could think about Biden sort of stretching out his body as a bridge between the old and new generations of leaders. Uh, and you could just go on and on. And bridge is not the only example of this kind of um, ability to make uh, progressive abstractions and metaphors to, uh, it, it's something that we could do with almost any concept. And, you know, this is Hofstadter, who was my PhD advisor, um, wrote that a concept itself is a package of analogies, just what um, I described with the concept of bridge, that it's uh, not a single sort of node in a network or a vector in a big vector space, but rather it's a, a complicated uh, dynamic sort of uh, package of all of these different analogies and metaphors. Uh, another thing about machine learning that we really have to make sense of and understand is how to make these systems more transparent and unbiased. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, often it's hard if we've trained a machine to do some task to understand exactly why it's making the decisions it made. So here's an example. One of my PhD students uh, trained a deep neural network to distinguish animals from not pictures, pictures with animals from pictures with no animal, okay? He used a, a data set of nature photographs and his system did very well on this task. But then when he tried to probe what features was it using to make this distinguish this, this, this distinction, he found that the machine was picking up at least in part on the background instead of the animal. And in fact, animal photos were more likely to be associated with blurry backgrounds because the photographer's focusing on the foreground the animal, whereas no animal photos are um, associated with clear backgrounds. And it's a lot easier to recognize a, a blurry background versus a clear background than an animal versus no animal. So that's what the machine had learned. So this is called a shortcut. Uh, it's when the machine learns something that is allows it to make uh, correct predictions, and yet it's not learning the underlying task. This is seen in a lot of examples. This particular paper from a few years ago showed that when you take a neural network that can uh, very confidently with 99% confidence recognize a fire truck and you Photoshop that object into non-standard positions that the machine hadn't been trained on, it was now very confident that it's a school bus or a fireboat or a bobsled. And, um, the, this high confidence really shows that these deep neural networks are learning something quite different from what we humans have learned or used to recognize these objects. And it's something that makes them um, biased or, or vulnerable to errors and attacks. Like when, for instance, Teslas uh, run into stopped fire trucks on the highway, which has happened surprisingly many times. These are Teslas using uh, self-driving software. Or when um, hackers or, or, or adversaries are able to uh, put stickers on stop signs to convince a uh, machine learning uh, vision system that it's a speed limit 80 sign and can do that uh, from many different vantage points and s s distances. Uh, this was a paper in 2017 from a group of security researchers. Uh, finally, as uh, Dreyfus, Hubert Dreyfus pointed out, the big problem is common sense and understanding. So, you know, one of the most common uh, accidents involving self-driving cars is that people rear end them. That is that the self-driving car slams on the brake and the person driving behind it is, wasn't expecting that. And so they slam into the car. Okay, so that's because the self-driving cars are stopping unexpectedly because they don't know 
how to decide something is an obstacle or not. For example, they might stop for a floating plastic bag, which a human using common sense would know is not something you need to stop for when you're driving. Or here in New Mexico, we see a lot of this kind of thing like tumbleweeds. You don't need to stop for those on the road. You don't need to slam on the brakes. Do you need to stop for a flock of birds? Well, I guess it sort of depends. You know, if you know, sometimes you know from common sense that they're just gonna fly away. Whereas you probably should stop and not drive over a pile of glass. Uh, should you stop and wait for this uh, snowman to cross the road? Uh, these are things that we humans are easily able to deal with, even if we've never seen anything like it before. Um, but self-driving cars, uh, not having common sense of humans, uh, don't know how to deal with this kind of situation. So a lot of people in AI now have said, yes, common sense is essential. How do we uh, give computers uh, common sense and have invested a lot of money in it, like Paul Allen, who uh, before he died, um, he invested a lot of money in his AI Institute in Seattle. Uh, the United States Defense Department is investing a lot of research funds into machine common sense. And interestingly, um, one of the grand challenges they have is to develop programs with the common sense of an 18 month old baby. So this is, uh, you know, getting back to Moravac's paradox, the idea that things that are easy for us are the hardest things for machines. So the common sense of a, you know, a pre pre linguistic 18 month old is something that now is a grand challenge for AI. So, you know, to, to, to understand situations like this, this is a photograph I came across and I talked about it in my book. I thought it was really interesting. How do we instantly categorize the situation and understand it, you know, and how would a self-driving car do that? Well, things that you would have to know, you have to know a lot of about sort of the, how the world works, what um, psychologists call intuitive physics, you know, that, um, for, for example, you know, if this woman pushes on this stroller, the stroller will move because it's on wheels. And when she pulls on the leash, you know, that will pull the dog also. Or intuitive biology, knowing why the dog is sniffing this, uh, this, this, this uh, pole and, and knowing that dogs will, uh, for example, you know, resist being pulled when they're trying to sniff something. Or intuitive psychology, knowing sort of what what this woman is doing and why you know that she's distracted or that she doesn't know this man you can really tell that just by an instance of of a glimpsing this um we we have a lot of mental models of cause and effect and vast world knowledge that allows us to understand and to abstract and make analogies and sort of categorize this situation as distracted pedestrian so these are all things that are some of the greatest challenges for AI systems today. But interestingly, back in uh, 1955, when these four pioneers of AI wrote a proposal for the sort of first big meeting on AI, the Dartmouth Summer Research Project, they proposed that some of the most important things that they would work on was how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts and solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. And you can say that these are still the biggest problems in AI, especially forming abstractions and concepts. In their book, Surfaces and Essences, about analogy, Hofstetter and Sander said, without concepts, there can be no thought. And without analogies, there can be no concepts. And I'll add to that and say, how to form concepts and make analogies are the most important open problems in AI. So I'll stop there. Um, if you're interested in uh, this, I talk about this in great detail in my book, my recent book about AI, and I'm happy to answer any questions.